All right, thanks. Thanks, Gary, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've done college tables last year, and uh, some of you I uh, would have been at, at these college tables where they talk about uh, trees, and so that's something I'm passionate about. And today's presentation is about how will trees cope with the changes in our climate? And I guess one of the big questions that we, we would all have is, is our tree future looking like this here on the left, where we all have healthy, you know, strong elms okay, with a little bit of a sparse uh, canopy in there? Or is the tree future for many of our trees more like this, uh, where because our climate is changing, uh, the trees will suffer? And so we're trying to unpick this dilemma now in the next 30 minutes or so. And so a few things you know, truth that I'm sure you all know, but I'd like to reiterate them there. Plants can't move. We just had lunch, and it was a very lovely lunch, and now we're enjoying our coffee, and if we want to have some more, we can just go to the bar and grab some. Plants can't do this. They're set there where they are. Wherever the seed will fall, they will grow where they germinate. So you have a seedling here, the seed falls, it germinates. And then it has to struggle through the first years of its life, and it becomes a satellite. And when it's very successful, it becomes like many of you in the room here, a mature tree. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, similar to you would have endured many days and years of rain, hail, and shine, frosts and heat waves, and floods and droughts and so on, trees will have to endure the same. And so, in some instances, and maybe some of us will get there. You know, you have an example like this Guilford tree here, Eucalyptus camaldulensis, which is thought to be over 500 years old. But just think about this for a moment, okay? There's the seedling that fell down 500 years ago in that very same spot where it stands now. And now it has endured all sorts of drought, all sorts of insect pests and diseases that were coming. It's still there. It's still growing. So there is a very much a very big inherent resilience in trees as well. We mustn't forget that. Uh, so another thing is trees do almost, or many or most of the things that they do through their leaves. That's a, that's a fact. You just have to think about it for a while. They regulate their food intake and their water loss through their leaves. So here's a leaf, and if we look at it a bit closer, we see these little things popping up. And there's little holes in the leaves called stomata. And these stomata are little uh, holes that they can open, like we have here, or they can close. And they can regulate the exchange of gases in and out of the tree. But they have a dilemma, of course, because the stomata, when they're open, they let the CO2 in, and they use the CO2 as their food, because they use the energy of the sun to take up the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So now we're here, we're all breathing CO2 out. So there's a lot of CO2. If you would have a tree in here, you have a good rain time, because there's all the CO2 that we breathe out, that they can take with the energy of the sun and make sugar out of it, and then they can grow. So if they leave their stomata open, the CO2 can come in. But at the same time, they lose water because the stomata are open, right? And so that is exposed to the atmosphere. So they're always in this dilemma of, do I open my soulmates and I get a lot of carbon in and I, I sequester something that I can eat? Or do I close them so I can save all the water that I have? And it really depends on the situation, the time of the day and the time of the year, whether they open or whether they close the soulmates. Because if they close them in summer, because it's too hot outside or too dry outside, of course, they, want to see, they will not get CO2 in. So they're going hungry. So they always have this dilemma of either going hungry or going thirsty, if you wish. So just put that in context, because some of the data that I will show later are in this context of, of how trees will deal with, with changes in our climate. So you would have all heard about this, and you probably have dealt with climate change a fair bit. Uh, there is predictions that our climate is changing. And here's just some uh, data about the rainfall deficiencies that we had uh, conveniently placed in what was the millennium drought in Victoria in the early 2000s there, where we really had the driest period on record. Um, but by and large, we can expect higher temperatures. 
in Melbourne and in Victoria. We can also expect lower rainfall, or probably less frequent rainfall, and we can expect more extreme weather events. And a colleague of mine, Dave Kendall, who also works at Burnley, has done an analysis of the historical climate in Melbourne over the last uh, 150 years. Because we, we have very good weather records, so we could look at the variation in temperature and the variation in rainfall in the city that we all love and in which we live. And amazingly, if you look at the longer term historical record from pre-1950s, the average mean annual temperature in Melbourne was 14.6 degrees. Probably what we have right now outside. <laughs> but that's the average temperature that we would have over the course of a year. And that goes up and down a little bit, as you can see here, but uh, it stayed relatively flat. If we look at the average current mean annual temperature here from 1996 to 2015, it is much higher. It's about two degrees warmer. So Melbourne in the last 150 years has already warmed. This is partly due to climate changes. It's partly due to urbanization. So us putting more concrete in the city, getting rid of more trees, less parks, more buildings in there, and the buildings, they have more heat, they trap more heat, particularly during the night, and that's why the city in itself is warmer. If you would go out and do the same thing outside of Melbourne, in the village, it wouldn't be as extreme as it is here. But of course, we still have trees in Melbourne, a lot of them. In the city of Melbourne, we have about 70,000 of them. So it's the area that we are here in Parkville, the CBD, Carlton, Kensington, and so on and so forth. So they will be exposed now to a much higher temperature. And if we look at the moderate climate futures here, we predict that by 2040, we will probably have a mean annual temperature of 17 degrees. <coughs> and if we go to extreme climate futures in 2090, that's about 19 degrees. So nice and toasty. <laughs> Um, back then, probably the, the, the temperature that we might have in this room rather than outside. But of course, I had to put it outside of this, of this chart here, the red line. You can see that up there. <coughs> Rainfall is varying, and it sort of has a downward trend, but it is always very variable in, in Melbourne, as you can see. We can get down to 400 millimeters of rainfall in one year, and we get up to almost 1,000 in another year. So there's a fair bit of variation. The big question now is, does this change in the climate do something to the tree population that we have in the city? And what does it do to trees in general? So a colleague of mine, David Kendall, did this analysis that he looked at the uh, temperature distribution of trees worldwide and in Melbourne. So this is eucalyptus lipoxylon, yellow gum, a reasonably widely distributed tree in Melbourne. And this is where it occurs. So here we had a different uh, climate that was a mean climate in Melbourne, so you'd think this is the number of records that we have around the world of this eucalyptus leucoxylin that was, that was found, and it is square within the historic climate. But it is not, if you look at the number of occurrences, really aligning well with the current temperature, and it is also not very well aligning with future temperatures, because it has a very relatively narrow climatic range. You compare this with another tree, one I'm sure you all know and you've seen and you love, jacaranda tree, that blossoms in these beautiful uh, purplish blue colors around December. And look at the temperature range of this jacaranda tree that originates from, from South America. It goes, grows from 12 degrees, mean annual temperature, up to 24 degrees. So a much wider range. And there's already tree, you know, individuals of these trees growing in a future Melbourne climate. So you would think that this tree is much more resilient to any changes that we have in the climate compared to this eucalyptus leucoxylin or the yellow gum there. And so David then took this analysis a bit further in trying to evaluate well, how many of the current trees that we have growing in Melbourne are actually vulnerable to changes in our climate. And so he did this by assuming that if a tree has a distribution at a temperature where the current temperature in Melbourne is warmer than the 97th percentile of the distribution of that tree, then it would be vulnerable. So that's a very technical term. Let me put it into a, a bit of an easier to understand framework. If the distribution of the tree, uh, or if, if, there, if there's only 3% of the trees uh, growing at the temperature that Melbourne currently has, then it would be very vulnerable because it would be very warm for that tree and the temperature that we currently have in Melbourne would be probably too warm for that tree to exist. 
So that would put it, give it a red uh, um, sort of marker there, and you think this is very vulnerable. If it's if 10% of the current tree population would be uh, uh, around or above Melbourne's temperature, then it would be somewhat vulnerable. And if the distribution of the tree is between the 10th and the 90th percentile, like this jacaranda tree here, then it wouldn't be very vulnerable. And so David then used this sort of uh, assessment, and if you wish, this is only a way of delineating is a tree vulnerable or not, to look at the 373 species that currently grow in the city area of, of Melbourne, so in the CBD and surrounding suburbs. And currently, 19% of trees that grow in Melbourne are already very vulnerable. And in the future, under moderate climate change by 2040, this will grow to about 35. And by 2019, it's 62% of the trees that will grow in a future Melbourne climate that has a mean annual temperature of 90 degrees. They will not have a distribution at this temperature right now. And so this to him said, well, this is really worrying because does it mean that these trees will no longer exist in Melbourne? Because they currently can't cope with the climate that's that warm, and we know Melbourne is going to get warmer because it has already started getting warmer. And so this is uh, now uh, a big question around how vulnerable are some of, of, of the trees. And here is an example, and I'll only pick a few. I know this is a lot of names, and it's probably a bit confusing. Um, but if you look at Eucalyptus camaldulensis, which is the most uh, abundant tree here in the city of Melbourne, actually, river red gum, a bit surprising, but it's about 7,000 examples of river red gum uh, in the, around the city area. That isn't really very vulnerable to climate change. You see, this is green currently, and it's green in 2040, and it's also green in 2090. So that's not a tree that we need to worry about because it has a very broad distribution already. It, it grows in very warm temperatures. But if you look at other trees like this one here, it's Quercus palustris. So this tree there. So it's an imported elm, uh, oak tree, and of course that is red already. And if uh, warming is happening, it means that uh, this tree is potentially very vulnerable to changes in that climate. Similar to, you know, well, one of my most uh, a tree to, uh, very close to my heart is the elm trees that we have in Melbourne, because they have been all almost uh, wiped out by Dutch elm disease in Europe. Um, and so I always love coming back to Melbourne if I travel overseas to see the elms here and the, the big parades that we have. But almonds minor, one of the, the major elm species that we have, very vulnerable to changes in climate because it's a cold adapted species. It doesn't really grow in very much warm climate. And so the question now is, can we delineate for some of the research that we have done elsewhere how vulnerable these trees really are? Because this is just looking at the current distribution of trees. So we use eucalypts, and eucalypts is, as you know, this is a map of, of Australia, and this is where eucalypts occur in Australia. They grow everywhere. It's an amazing thing about these things. They grow in deserts. They grow in savanna regions up here in the north. They grow in woodlands, so where it's slightly drier. They grow in dry sculpted of forests that we have outside of Melbourne. They grow in wet sculpted of forests in the east, and they grow in tall and moist rainforests like we have in the ash forests uh, in, in the central highlands along Marysville. So they really grow everywhere. But one of the things about eucalypts is that some of them have really narrow distribution ranges. So they occur in a very narrow climatic range, if you wish. So only about one degree of mean annual temperature like this one, uh, gray box, Eucalyptus macrocarpa. And if you look at that, how it's distributed, it follows this rain band that we have right here. It's a very narrow rain band. Other eucalypts, like this Eucalyptus ob obliqua here, Mesmate, has a much wider distribution. It grows across a much broader environmental range. So what does it mean that many of our eucalypts are now in very narrow bands? Does it mean that if our, chain, if our climate is changing, are they under threat? Um, and so, we have done a fair bit of research that look into this um, to figure out how do eucalypts really adapt to these changes in the climate? Because there's about 900 species of eucalypts, about 150 in Victoria, and they really have very distinct shapes and they have very distinct distributions as well. So the main question was, are eucalypts under threat from a rapidly changing climate? And are the narrow distributed eucalypts uh, more under threat than others? So we built an arboretum at the Burnley campus of the university and grew 20 different eucalyptus species there from a broad range of climates, from very dry 
to very wet. We even had some uh, some snow gum uh, growing there. Not very well at Burnley, um, but then the Mary species from the desert didn't grow very well either. But we had all of the trees at the same spot, and so it was a perfect opportunity to say, "Well, see, I didn't." Just put it away. <laughs> This is just to wake people up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we had the, we had all of these trees growing there, and then we measured stuff with them. And so here's one of the things that uh, Carola Pritzker, one of our PhD students, measured, which is the sapwood area to leaf area ratio. And all of these uh, graphs have um, precipitation, the mean annual precipitation, where the trees would originate from here at the bottom. This is very dry, 300 millimeters of mean annual rainfall, and very wet. 1,300 millimeters. And what we can see is that this set wood area to leaf area ratio means that the more arid a species is, the smaller the leaves are, and the less leaf area we have for water transport. Same thing is you can calculate something that's called cavitation resistance or how vulnerable they are to embolism, air embolisms that will interrupt their water flux. And then the same situation happens there is that the dry species have more narrow vessels, but they're less prone to these kind of embolisms. Then we looked at the wilting point, if you wish, of these plants, and uh, do they have similar wilting points or differences? Again, very much the drier species or from, from lower rainfall areas are much more resistant to drought, per se, because they wilt at a lower water potential, or that means they can withstand more dryness. And some of you would have had this, you know, this is a tomato plant, You've been out and about, you came back, it's a hot summer's day, it looks like this. Uh, that's when it has lost its turga, and it's hanging in there like that, uh, and you have to irrigate it because otherwise it will die. So it can come back, but this measurement of this turga loss point is a really good uh, 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 parameter that will tell us how vulnerable or how resilient these, these trees can be. The next one is embolism, so we can directly measure the water stress under which these trees actually have these embolisms and then uh, it, it disrupts their water transport. And again, the drier species here are more drought tolerant, which is kind of logical that they are, but we grew them all at the same spot, right? We didn't grow them at their native environment, we grew them all at Burnley. And so this means that the expression of these traits of this drought tolerance is really genetically controlled. It's not something that the trees would have learned it's something that the trees will have inherited from their parents. So they make smaller leaves, they are more drought tolerant there, and this was one interesting learning. Another one was, can they change some of these traits if the going gets tough? So this is the turga loss point again, so this you know, tree going a bit floppy. Um, and this delineates, or this shows us that if we have a, a, an autumn period, then yes, the trees can become more drought tolerant by a little bit but all of them became drought-tolerant to the same extent. So the wetter species, the ash species here that grow in the wetter areas would also be more drought-tolerant if, if, if they're summer. So they can tolerate more water deficits, if you wish. And the same is true with the stomatal opening there. So eucalypts can adjust to the drier conditions. They can minimize their water loss by controlling the amount of water that they lose, and they can become more drought-tolerant. And so now we try to find out whether that's all grown at the same spot. How is that when we go into the nature? How do we go now measuring these trees in their real environment? So we are here in Melbourne, and this is a gradient of sites that we sampled from Ballarat down to, to Meredith. Um, so Geelong would be down here. Uh, a range of different uh, climates, so mean annual precipitation of 600 to about 1,000 millimeters. So uh, you know, drier areas and wetter areas. And we find the same things that we found previously, again, that the drier eucalypts are more drought tolerant, that they can have an adjustment in summer, and so that they become more drought tolerant. Um, so they have a genetic component to it, but they have also an ability to adjust. So what do we learn from this? There's strong correlations between what we would call these traits that make or break a tree and the rainfall distribution in eucalypts. If we have greater aridity, by and large, the water transporting tissues that these trees are are smaller. And they have denser wood, they have a slow water transport, so they are not very fast in transporting water through their vessels. Uh, and then they have smaller and thicker leaves, and they have less leaf area, and overall smaller trees. Put it another way, 
this is a genetic makeup of a dry and arid eucalypt, and it has very narrow vessels. Have you ever had a very tiny straw and you tried to suck water through that straw? <laughs> very slow going, right? If you go and have a bigger straw, you can suck much easier. And that's the same with the trees. So genetically, they come up when the arid eucalypts have these very narrow vessels, which means they have a very slow water transport. But in summer, it's very dry and it's very hot. And so it means that there's very slow wood transport to the leaves, which means they can only make very small leaves. And they only cannot make very many leaves because it's too hot and dry for them. And that means they're not really getting a lot of carbon into them because they, don't have, they only have small leaves and there's not many of them. And that means, by and large, they're very short. So if you go to the Mali region and you look at some of the Mali's in Mildura, these trees will only be about five to eight meters tall. And if you grow them in Melbourne, they will not grow 20 meters tall. They'll stay about 5 to 8 meters tall because that's what the genetically they're, uh, they're, 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 they're fixed there. So if you then, of uh, course, this then lower amount of carbon gain that you get is feeding back into this sort of makeup of, of these trees as well. So in the wet environment, it's the exact opposite. So if you grow in a very moist environment when you have no drought and it's always nice and um, and, and rainy, you have very wide vessels, which means you can have a fast water transport, which means you can support much larger leaves, more overall leaf area, you get more carbon in, because you have more photosynthesis, and that means you can grow much taller. And so you could have this remnants, tallest flowering plant on the planet, grows up to 100 meters tall, can do that because its genetic makeup allows it to do that. So from our research, we know that there's some traits, we call it, some facets of a tree that are genetically controlled in eucalypts, and it will be for other trees as well. One is the structure of the wood. It's the vessel structure, so the water transport system in a tree, that is genetically fixed. The general leaf shape, if you have a eucalypt that has leaf shape like that, it will not change all of a sudden because it gets dried to eucalypt that looks like this. Um, and the tree height is also. So this is long-term genetic adaptation. It's an evolutionary process where over hundreds and thousands of years, uh, the environment is selected for these kind of traits. But then we also have other traits that eucalypts can change, and they change if it gets drier, if it gets hotter. They can change the stomatal opening, we've seen this. They can also change their leaf size. The leaf size can become smaller or bigger, depending. If you grow it in a wetter area, you can have slightly bigger leaves than you are in a drier area. And you can have more or less leaves, which is probably one of the most important uh, ways how, how many trees actually uh, adapt to, to change, a rapid change in the climate, is just drop leaves. It's actually a good thing because it protects the tree from dying out because it, it reduces its, its area that it loses water from. Uh, and so uh, a tree that is losing a lot of leaves in summer is by and large a defense mechanism of the tree uh, by preventing it from drying out. So eucalypts are well adapted to their climate. They can adjust to change in the climate already because they have these things that they can tweak and pull. Uh, but then you still have the question, do these narrow climatic changes matter? And I'll give you two examples. Radiata pine. It's also called Monterey pine. Pinus radiata originates uh, from very three small distinct locations in California, near Monterey. That's where they're from. So it's a very distinct, very tiny area in which they grew from. If you think back from David Kendall's distribution, it would be one degree of temperature where they come from, because this is San Francisco up there, as well as Angeles down there, so that's where they come from. Now where do they grow? Here's where they grow in Australia right now. One of the most important softwood plantation species, and chances are, if you're building a house right now, that this frame is built from radiata pine. Because it can grow all the way to the East Coast, it's one of the most important tree species to grow in New Zealand as well. So just because you have a very small origin where you come from, doesn't mean that you can't really live in a much bigger environment. Other example is sugar gum, Eucalyptus cladocalyx. Originates from three distinct populations in South Australia, in the Flinders Ranges, the Alpha Peninsula, and Kangaroo Island. Now, this is where it's distributed in Australia. All throughout Victoria and South Australia, it's often used as, a, as an arid 
zone plantation species, and it's used like these beautiful uh, trees here in alleys along uh, trees like Carnival. So if you drive out the, the Western Freeway, you see a lot of sugar gums planted on the roadsides there. Again, eucalyptus example showing a very tiny, narrow original distribution, but actually the uh, um, ability of a tree to grow in, in different plants is much bigger than its original plant origin. And this is why, because particularly the rainfall is always very variable. Look at the Melbourne rainfall record for the last 150 years. Yeah. It grows from almost 1,000, and this is just the blow up here from 1980 to 2011. And here we have sort of a you know, millennium drought where it never really got above uh, the average rainfall there until then the drought broke in 2010. This has caused a lot of angst and stress to the urban trees because it was for a long period so dry. But by and large, you take a much longer record and think about the Guildford tree, the 500 year old tree, he would have had to live through, or it would have had to live, could have been she as well, right? Uh, would have had to live through all of this. Actually, it is probably he, she, because anyway, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, so it had to live through all of these differences in, 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 in changes in climate because one year it rains a lot, next year it doesn't rain much. So all the trees, by and large, are not really all that vulnerable because they're very well established. If they're in a native environment, they have access to hundreds and thousands of liters of water in the soil because they have big root systems and they go deep down and they can access a lot of moisture that nothing else, more than living organisms can access. All the trees have also dealt with a lot of changes in the climate and they store a lot of water in their trunk as well. So they really have uh, a good solid defense mechanism against rapid changes in the climate. Young trees are the most vulnerable ones, so, but chances are if you put something in your garden and you get a really dry summer or it's very hot and you have a few heat waves, things that would die, they're the young ones. It's not the older ones. And so the last thing I want to, want to get to probably is um, the tree distribution is really probably the one thing that we need to be more worried about than whether a tree that's old and established most likely will not die. And in cities we have many ways of dealing with changes in our plant anyway. And we can get to that in question time, if there is question time. But the tree distribution, the native tree distribution, depends on flowering. Now, when do I set flowers? When do I set seeds? How do I disperse these seeds? So how do I get them from A to B? When do they germinate? And how do they germinate? And how do I establish? And in a native tree situation, a lot of this really depends on climate. Whether a tree makes flowers in the first instance depends on the weather. Whether a tree can germinate depends on growing degree days or cold, chilling factors and so on and so forth. So this is where a lot of trees might really struggle in the native distribution because this dispersal mechanism and its distribution mechanisms are influenced. Unfortunately, we don't have very many good data on how this is happening. So for native forest futures, we probably still don't know much about which trees are really vulnerable but on the other hand, the distribution of trees is also something that we as humans can influence. And we already do this. If we have a major bushfire bush event, for example, in the Central Highlands, an ash tree, a mountain ash, for example, takes 20 years before it sets seeds. 20 years it has to be old before it first time sets seeds, it flowers and sets seeds. So it means if we have a bushfire now, and then the whole ash forest comes back and regenerates, but then we have a bushfire within this 20 year period, all the seed bank is gone. And so what the DELP and the management agencies are doing is they're putting in a seed that they have collected before from this area out into the sea so that these trees can germinate again, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to. And in cities, of course, we have many, many ways of how we can manage our trees and how we can nurture them through, through difficult periods. And if you wish, we could talk about that. Uh, in question time, but uh, that's all for me now. Thanks for your attention.